Good evening. Welcome to this, our sixth Bible study session, looking at the Gospel of St. Luke. As always, I'll wait just a few more moments to see if people will join us. Okay, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to thee, our God, glory to thee. O heavenly King, O comforter, the Spirit of truth, who art in all places, and who fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us. Cleanse us from all impurities, and of thy goodness save our souls. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. All Holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy One, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Amen. May the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Session six. And we are looking tonight at uh, chapter two, verses one to 14, which is a bit curious to be reading this time of year it's just how things have played out because of course in the orthodox church we are still in lent we are three and a half weeks away from pascha and in the west uh, they have just or you have just had easter so whilst in the church we are very much focused on the crucifixion and the resurrection of christ in our bible study Tonight, we are looking at the incarnation of the birth, the nativity of Christ. But as always, that will be in part two of uh, this evening's session. Part one, as, as you will remember, we look at the ways that Holy Scripture is used. The Bible, and especially the New Testament, is used within the Orthodox Church, the place that we have in it, and how it is used in our worship. Uh, last time we spoke about this, uh, we looked at how the divine liturgy, particularly in the church and other services within the church, are saturated, absolutely saturated, with words taken directly from Scripture, whether that be from the Old Testament, from the Psalter, from the New Testament, particularly from the Gospels. This week, I want to look or consider about what we do with the object of the Bible. The object of a Bible, the Bible is actually a thing. It has a physical being, as it were. And as such, we treat the Bible in a very particular way within the Orthodox Church as an object, an object which is holy. Holy means set aside, and in the case of Christianity, holy means set aside specifically for God and for us in our worship. Now, you may remember that uh, when we look at Holy Scripture, um, from the beginning of Genesis through to the end of the Revelation to St John, we see 
all of it within the context or through the eyes of the coming of our Lord and God and Saviour Jesus Christ. It is the story of our salvation. It is our salvation history. We don't say, as you may remember, that the Bible was somehow dictated verbatim by God, but nevertheless, crucially, the Holy Scripture, every word in Holy Scripture, is inspired by God through the Holy Spirit, the inspired Word of God. So to us, Holy Scripture is another icon, an image of something divine, an image. An icon is something um, we use very particularly in the Orthodox Church. An icon is not a work of art. True iconography conveys truth, the truth about that which is depicted. Um, of course, we do not worship icons. They are, <laughs> at the end of the day, pieces of paper or pieces of pigment on a board. They are not in themselves, in, their, in the fabric of their being. They are not divine. Only God is divine. Nevertheless, we reverence the icons in the same way that, well, for example, downstairs in my sitting room, I have a photograph of my father who died 12 years ago. And uh, every time I look at that photograph of my father, I don't see pieces of chemical fig pigment making colour on a piece of paper which is put in the frame. I see that person who is my dad. And I love my dad. And when I see his photograph, I express within my heart the love I have for him. And it is the same with our icons, our, our visual icons. We give them due reverence for the person that they portray. Ultimately, and I can't go into this now, it's beyond the context of this uh, Bible study, but ultimately all icons are in fact of Christ. Even icons of the Mother of God, icons such as this, icons of the saints, icons of uh, particular moments from, from the scriptures or from the lives of saints. Ultimately, all these are of Christ because it is only through Christ that we have eternal life and we are become holy. We are become saints. We are become Christ's ourselves with a small c through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's only through him his, his, his incarnation, his salvation, the redemption of the world through him, that we can portray icons and we can venerate the saints who are depicted within them. So, for us, this Holy Bible, as an object, is holy, sacred and reverenced. So what does that mean, practically? Well, it means during our services at certain points. For example, during the matins service on feast days like Sundays and other great feast days is venerated. In fact, it's, it's the gospel book which is venerated. That section of the Bible which speaks to us about Jesus Christ is held up for veneration by the faithful. We kiss it. We kiss it in the way that we would kiss the icon of Christ, because it is, it is in a very similar way an icon of Christ as well. 
it is also used during the divine liturgy. In fact, the first action the priest does at the start of the divine liturgy involves the gospel book, which is placed on the holy table. It also affects how we treat the Bible at home. The Bible is a sacred object, so we're careful with it. It is placed on the table. If it is placed on the table, we don't put any other junk or rubbish on top of it. Because it is an image of Christ for us. In the same way, the photograph I have of my father, if I put that on the table, I'm not going to pile up dirty dishes on top of it. No, because it represents someone who I love. We're careful with our icons. We acknowledge their sanctity, their holiness, but they are not divine in themselves. What they do is they point us to the real, true and living God. Incarnate within our Lord and God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who through him we dare to call God Father, through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So moving on quickly to part two, we have, which is for me, one of the most moving and powerful pieces of scripture certainly within the Gospels. Every time I read this, it sends shivers down my spine. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God. So what do we have here? We have a heavily pregnant Mary, the Holy Virgin, Mother of God, and her betrothed husband, Joseph, travelling to the city of David to take part in the census. It's interesting, um, like at the beginning of the Gospel of St Luke, Luke is very keen to pinpoint a, the particular place in time to create for us in our minds the history by naming particular people and events so we can place it very, very closely 
and he does it here. He mentions the decree from Caesar Augustus, and he mentions Cyrenius, who is the governor of Syria. Now Cyrenius, or Quirinius, another way of saying his name, uh, was a Roman aristocrat. Um, he was appointed uh, legate governor of Syria um, um, until AD 21, upon his death. And um, the province of Judea had been added to his his region, if you like, for, for the purposes of the Roman census. So for administrative purposes, the city of David, Bethlehem, came under Syria for regional governance of this census. So we know very clearly when this happened, but St Luke is telling us uh, about people who are who were real life um, people, well known, documented. They are in the documented history of the Roman Empire. So we know exactly when, the, the, the period when this happened. Mary is described as Joseph's espoused wife being great with child. What does that mean? We touched on this before, uh, looking at chapter 1. If you remember, marriage within the Jewish tradition was in two parts. The espousal, the engagement, and the actual wedding. Now, when you were espoused, you were you were married, but not fully. You had started to enter into the state of being married. And so you were husband and wife. But you were not fully husband and wife until the wedding had been completed. And so you do not, you did not enter the matrimonial bed uh, to become as one flesh until you were fully married. So Mary is described as being Joseph's espoused wife, being great with child. So a scandal to all who didn't know actually what had happened. There's no scandal. We know what happened with the virgin birth. Um, so I'll leave that there. And so it was that while they were there, so in Bethlehem, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room at the inn. This idea or rather the idea, not this idea, the idea that the incarnate Son of God, the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world, should be born in a stable amongst the animals and placed in the feeding trough of those same animals within the straw and the hay is an outrageous idea. Certainly to the, to the Jewish people, it's also an outrageous idea to the philosophical Greeks and later on to the Muslims. Why? Because the Son of God, in their eyes, the Messiah in their eyes is someone who is all powerful, powerful physically, mighty in strength, a great warrior, someone whose strength 
encompasses great wealth. The king of kings should be born in a palace. But no. Straight away, St Luke introduces us to the reality of the topsy-turvy nature, if you like, the paradox, the great paradox of Christianity demonstrated to us by the life and words and works of Jesus Christ. The poor will become rich. The rich will become poor. The holy, only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, is born in a place of poverty. And that, that breaks apart the preconceived idea of what strength and power is. St Bede says of this, he who clothes the whole world with its various beauty, he is wrapped up in common linen, that we might be able to receive the best robe. He, by whom all things are made, is folded both hands and feet, that our hands might be raised up for every good work and our feet directed in the way of peace. God has become poor, that we may become rich, but rich in the ways of God, not in the ways of the world. So Luke carries on, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Shepherds. What do we say, or what do we know about shepherds? Again, we've touched on this before. Shepherds in first century Palestine were tantamount to outcast. They were vile. They were apart from the city, from the town. They were not respected. They were generally seen as vulgar, rough peasants. The last people you would expect the angel of God and the heavenly hosts to appear to, to announce the incarnation of Christ. God doesn't go, doesn't send his angel to Herod or to Quirinius, to the nobles, to the aristocracy, to the leaders, to the powerful within the world to declare and announce the, the incarnation of his son. No. He tells the poorest of the poor, the wretched, the outcast, the weak, the meek, the vulgar, the dirty. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were sore afraid, I'm sure they were. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people, not just the nation of Israel, not just for the people of Palestine, not just for the faithful Jews, which shall be for all people, for us too, for us. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So Luke is very keen to share with us that message. That Christ has not come to heal the healthy, save the saved. 
We can discuss what that means at a different time. It's a bit out of context for this study, but it's very clear. God is turning over the tables of worldly expectation right from the moment, in fact, before the moment of the birth of our Lord and God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. A new paradigm has entered the world. And after the death and resurrection of that same person who was born in a stable, the whole of the created universe throughout all of time and all of space is forever changed. Glory to God in the highest, indeed. Thank you for watching this this evening. Please tune in again next week. God willing, we'll be moving on with uh, chapter two of St Luke's Gospel. My name is Subdeacon Chad. Please remember me in your prayers. Please pray for the Orthodox Mission here in North Lincolnshire. And I hope I wish you a safe and blessed week. And I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, bless. Through the prayers of the Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Amen.